a long time ago, when I had a little more hair, I was obsessed with guitar. Not just the playing of the instrument, but just getting that right sound. I spent hours and hours trying out different tube amps, different pedals, different ways of changing the electronics inside my instruments. I realized then that if I wanted to get my own sound, I couldn't do it by just buying things just off the shelf. I had to customize and make my own tools for my sound. That was an important lesson that I learned that I carry today as a designer, whether I'm making websites, mobile apps, or, in, or instruments. So I'm really interested in what makes instruments resonate. Not just the sound, but how they resonate for humans, for people. There was a time when I was in university, I was studying music, and a professor came up to me and said, you know, you're gonna have to focus. Right now, you're studying jazz guitar, you're doing a bit of classical stuff, you're gonna need to find one area to focus. And, and that just didn't sit well with me, so I went and asked around, and what I found was other people said, I wouldn't listen to that person. <laughs> so I ended up learning about recording on a Mac, I learned, I, which changed my whole career. And it, I didn't know it then, but this was the beginning of me being a polymath. It's a term you probably haven't heard, it's not common. A polymath is someone that has multiple areas of expertise. There, I suspect there are many of you in this room today. It goes by many names. Uh, some you may know, some you may not know. Um, I've been called a unicorn <laughs> in the Vancouver design industry here. Uh, a term I, I didn't really like that much, uh, but this was something that um, people had to uh, use as a label because they thought it was a way to describe someone that knows how to design and code and run a business all at the same time, must be a unicorn. So there's this raging debate right now, online and off, about specialists versus generalists. I want to be clear here, I'm not talking about generalists, people that skim the surface of an, a number of different areas of discipline. What I'm talking about is the polymath has depth in a number of areas. And I'm going to describe to you a few polymaths that it'll, it'll become really clear where that value is. But today, we don't really uh, celebrate the polymath. There's a lot of rewards given to the specialists, they get higher salaries, but the polymath tends to not have, uh, it's not celebrated. So I'd, I'd like to ask a question, who do you think the Renaissance women and men are today? This diagram represents where polymaths really glue the different dis disciplines together. I've been in a number of situations where I've seen uh, people that have multiple areas of discipline uh, become the binding agent between these different areas. So I think they're incredibly important. These are the uh, different characteristics that make up a polymath. They tend to see the macro and the micro at the same time, a really valuable skill, as well as they have an addiction to learning. So that those two things help them become really adaptive, and they, these are amazing characteristics for creative people moving into an uncertain future. So, the most famous of polymaths, Leonardo da Vinci, also, amongst all the millions of inventions that he made, made some really, really interesting musical instruments. And that brings me to, when you look at instruments, they haven't fundamentally changed since the Renaissance period, the guitar and the piano, the most popular instruments of our day are still instruments that haven't changed since that time. Why is that? When we have technology jumping in leaps and bounds, 
the instruments haven't really been following that. The, uh, so there's an opportunity here for us as creative people to forge some new instruments. And this might be important to, to you if you're not a musician. It'll be important to you to think about how you might create your own tools of expression. Um, I've, I've, in many different uh, walks of life, I, I, I tend to meet people all in different areas of creativity and they all work at making their own create, uh, creative tools because the tools that you use to produce actually shape the outcomes. You may look at this period between 1970 and 2020 as, an, as one of transition for musical instruments, when people played music with switches created for data entry, not for creating music. That's a quote by Roger Lynn. He said that recently. Uh, Roger Lynn is the person responsible for the sampling drum machine. Also, you can see he's a musician as well. This is Bob Moog. Bob Moog is famous, uh, the pioneer in modern synthesis, uh, also a dabbler, someone that played music, someone that played, uh, played around with electronics a lot and was constantly asking other musicians to try his synthesizers. And there's Les Paul, uh, a very famous musician as well as the inventor of the modern solid body guitar also the person that invented multi-track recording, really changed the, how we record music. But what makes a great musical instrument? Well, first consider that any object can become a musical instrument. You just have to put an object in front of a child and you'll see right away that they'll turn it into a musical instrument. So it's not really the object itself that makes a musical instrument but more the actions which are enacted upon it. This is a great example, should challenge you. I never would have considered a wooden match an instrument until I saw Ranji Bakhmatar's tiny combustion. Here's another interesting instrument. It's uh, the Swiss company Teenage Engineering. This is called the OP-1. It's a small toy-sized keyboard that sounds incredible. It's become quite popular. You can see by the way it looks and its interface that it's a really popular a uh, playful approach to musical instrument. Also, is their pocket operator, a uh, little calculator sized beat beatbox and bass line generators that are so fun to play with. The, the thing I wanna point out here is these pocket operators, you can connect them together and makes for a really interesting social uh, situation. And then there's Roly. This is a UK company that makes a keyboard called the Seaboard that they found a way to, to uh, cover a traditional keyboard layout with a squishy rubber material that really allows a, in, uh, the player to slur between notes and move into notes, uh, uh, which adds to the 
or maximizes the expression of that instrument. But all the examples aren't amazing. Technology is sometimes used in a way that's overpowering. Um, if you consider the way that a musician has to uh, express a note, there's a lot of nuance in which they have to play. Sometimes replacing uh, when a musician plays a string with a button isn't gonna do the, the same job. So as musicians, we think a lot about that uh, that connection we have with the instrument and it has to, the, the action in, in which we take on the instrument and the sound that is produced has to be incredibly uh, uh, tightly coupled. So this is getting lost when we see examples that are driven more by the technology than by musicians. So I wanna stress these three points. Instruments need to be playable, they need to be expressive, and they need to be social. So I'm gonna take a moment to have a little social interaction with you. Hopefully you will play along with me. So I'm gonna start playing. Someone's gonna hand out some instruments and then I'll give you some prompts to play along with me. for you as it was for me. <laughs> um, I want to remind you that if anyone ever tells you to focus on one thing, the you, follow your passions, because you just might be a polymath too. Thank you. <laughs> 